Thank you so much. And thank you for your patience. I, it's in, ironic that I had internet issues <laughs> to get on. <laughs> we were saying that behind the scenes of all people, right? <laughs> thank you very but much. Anyway, um, but all's well, you know, now I'm back. And uh, I wanted to talk to you about the surprising truth behind the leading cause of climate change. And that's the title of my presentation. And to me, you know, it has been a journey of understanding. Uh, uh, I was born in the 60s. So I was born in 1960. And uh, there was a movie that came out in the 60s called Dr. Strangelove. And so I sort of did a play on that because my name is Dr. Strange Raw, <laughs> or how I learned to stop worrying and love climate change. It's actually not me, it's my granddaughter who helped me with this. My granddaughter was born in 2010. And you know, um, when she was born, I was probably one of the most depressed environmentalists on the planet because I thought there was nothing I could do and that we were going to hell in a handbasket. And we are the only species that doesn't belong on Earth. So that was the idea that I had in my mind. And uh, so I came to see her when she was a month old. And you can see her in my arms there. And she looked up at me and she smiled. And she had this very knowing smile. As if she was reading my thoughts. And she was saying, what do you mean I don't belong? I belong exactly as I am. And you're a fool. You haven't understood me. That hit me right away because I had this sensation going up and down my spine, you know, as if I'd seen some, I'd seen something amazing. And uh, I'm a systems engineer, and by, in systems engineering, we know that genuine systems analysis is really not about finding solutions. It's about understanding. It's about understanding the problem. Because once you understand the problem correctly, the solution presents itself. And that's what William Wofel said it's written in his book. Uh, when he said genuine systems analysis is not about solutions, but it's about wisdom. So let me take you through my uh, understanding of where we are in climate change and why I see climate change as a signal from nature saying you're done with this old phase your infantile phase, and you need to move on. You need to grow up as a species. So that's the message she's sending us. And this is why I see that as a, as a good sign that someone is looking after us. See, if you look at all the Earth systems, biosphere, geosphere, atmosphere, and hydrosphere, and how we as a species interact with these Earth systems, uh, we have the ethnosphere in the middle. The atmosphere is the sum of all of our thoughts, words, and actions over the past three million years of our existence, all put together. That's the atmosphere. That has been impacting the Earth systems in a way that Earth systems are now out of balance. Okay? So now we now know that we have the, the strength and the ability to actually change the systems of the earth, the biosphere, the geosphere, atmosphere, hydrosphere, everything, cryosphere, we change, we can change them all. We can change them for the worse or for the better. It's up to us now to choose how we do this. Okay? So if you look at the atmosphere and what we have done over the last 3 million years, and we set the context in time and you know, the gift that my granddaughter gave me was to say, look at it as if you are being used, as opposed to thinking that we are changing something. No, you're not changing anything. <laughs> you're part of nature. Nature is using us. So we are a tool of nature, right? So if you look at it that way, then nature gave us control of fire 500,000 years ago. Okay. So what I'm showing here is the temperature of the earth in white and the CO2 level, the carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. So this is a graph. This is like a graph that we draw. You know, we, we draw graphs like this in, in high school, right? So the y-axis represents the CO2 in ppm or the temperature in Fahrenheit on the right side. And the x-axis represents um, 
the years before present. So that's what they call before BP, year BP, before present. So this means that, you know, 400,000 years ago, we were in a warm period and 450,000 years ago, we were in a cold period. So it was an ice age. So this white line shows us going in and out of the ice age, the earth going in and out of the ice age. And it has been doing that over the last 3 million years. It's gone through over 100 ice ages and warm periods in between. Now, if you look further back, before 3 million years, the CO2 levels in the atmosphere were actually much higher than they are today. So it has been coming down over time, the CO2 levels. And as a result, the temperature had been coming down. And, and then over the last 3 million years, we've gone through this ice age and, and interglacial period, a warm period in between ice ages. And during that time, the Earth spawned us as a species spawned us as a species, and then 500,000 years ago gave us control of fire, and then 50,000 years ago gave us partnership with wolves or dogs. Okay? They became our dogs, domesticated animals. And the wolves gave us their sense of smell and their sense of hearing, and they helped us detect predators before the predators could catch us and kill us. This allowed human beings to spread out of Africa and go to every corner of the globe in the previous ice age. So that happened about 50,000 years ago. And now we are in the current warm period. Okay? So that started 20,000 years ago. And if you look at the current warm period 20,000 years ago that it started, it looks exactly like the warm period that happened three ice ages ago. It's almost exactly like that. Except instead of going down and down and down back into another ice age, something happened here and the temperatures kind of stayed up and then went up. And something happened to the CO2 levels as well. The CO2 levels didn't go down, they started going up. So what happened? What happened is that 10,000 years ago, we started agriculture. We started agriculture and then we started burning down forests and sending all the carbon that's stored in trees up into the atmosphere as CO2. So this is what I call the Homo sapiens effect. And this is from a book by William Ruddiman in 2014. He wrote this book called Plows, Plagues, and Petroleum, where he showed this curve. This, he showed how the CO2 levels in the atmosphere matched what was happening three ice ages ago until about 6,000 years ago. And then you see it taking off. It went up and it stayed up at 280 parts per million. That is the human effect. The same with the methane. Methane started going up around 5,000, 4,000 years ago. That's from growing rice and from animal agriculture, from the cows. Okay, so the humans essentially heated up the earth. So we heated up the earth. And here's the temperature again. From 20,000 years ago, the red line is the temperature. The temperature was below glaciation, glaciation threshold, meaning we were in an ice age 20,000 years ago. And then it came up and up and it went over the glaciation threshold about 10,000 years ago. And that's when we started agriculture. And then it would have gone back down to another ice age 5,000 years ago, except we kept the temperature constant by burning down forests and raising animals. And so, in effect, by the time the Industrial Revolution began, we had increased the temperature by A, this value A, which is actually greater than B, the increase in temperature that has happened since the Industrial Era began. So, this temperature increase of A was caused by deforestation and animal agriculture, starting 8,000 years ago. And the increase in temperature B is caused by both animal agriculture and by burning fossil fuels. And so now we are here today, okay? And we are now here and we are feeling the effect of climate change. And that is nature telling us you're done with heating the planet. Now you have to start harmonizing and bringing it back to the setting, the thermostat setting, which is here. So you need to bring the temperature back to this and keep it there and you can now do it by bringing back the forest that you cut and stop raising animals for food. If you did that, 
because A is greater than B, you can bring it down and you can keep it there. So all the fossil fuel that you put into the atmosphere will still be up in the air, and therefore the Earth will not go back to another ice age. Okay, so that's the the right approach to harmonizing the climate and healing the climate. The other approach is to say, no, 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 we are going to continue eating animals, we are going to continue destroying the planet, and then we are going to heat up the planet to a point where the permafrost will just spew out methane like crazy and the earth will go into a Venus syndrome. Venus syndrome, meaning our sister planet Venus, has a surface temperature of 460 degrees Celsius or about 900 degrees Fahrenheit. Nothing lives on that, okay? It's dead. And we have the potential to either turn the earth into a Venus or we have the potential to heal the earth and bring it back to a harmonized setting and we become the climate harmonizing species of the planet. Those are the two possible futures for us. Now, what is the future that I want for my granddaughter? And for my children, it's this green line, not the red line. I'm not interested in the red line anymore. I want to do the green line, okay? So that's the signal that Earth is sending us. So in March 25th of this year, just a couple of weeks ago, a huge chunk of ice the size of Manhattan fell off Antarctica into the ocean. And it did that, it fell off Antarctica because the temperatures in Antarctica were 70 degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal. Think about that, 70 degrees Fahrenheit higher than normal. There is no model that predicts that. There is no model that predicts that. So, I mean, this is outside the realm of what we are imagining could have happened to us. Okay? So now is the time to just Acquire some humility. Even for scientists, I'm telling a scientist, acquire some humility. Don't tell us that we can still, you know, mess around with nature and tweak it and, you know, and the conquer and subdue nature to shake her to her foundations. This is how Sir Francis Bacon initiated the scientific revolution. Yeah, now we have science. And with that, we can now conquer and subdue nature to shake her to her foundations. Guess what? We are a part of nature. You shake nature, you're going to shake your own teeth in your own skull. So it's time to acquire some humility as a species. That's the message that uh, Mother Nature is sending us. And it is connected with colonialism, with racism, and all the social justice issues. If you think about colonialism 1.0, it's the same mindset of conquering and subduing nature that leads people to go and conquer and subdue other people. So they came and conquered and subdued India. Fine. Okay. They, they hung Indians by the lamppost in the, just 100 years ago. That's how Indians were being treated. They were being hung by the lamppost for defying the British. Okay. So that was colonialism 1.0, the direct form of going and subjugating and oppressing other people saying that I'm superior to you and I can do what I want. Then in the 1940s and 50s, all these countries got independence from the European powers. So we were all told, hey, you have independence now. So you, colonialism is over. Congratulate yourself. You are now independent. But in reality, did the... European powers suddenly have an attack of conscience, and this is why they gave everybody independence, or did they figure out something? What they figured out was that they don't need to go and directly oppress people in order to subjugate them and extract from them. They can do it indirectly. And they did it indirectly through these mechanisms that I'm going to show you. And it has to do with dairy and animal agriculture. So this is Operation Flood. And this was funded by the European Economic Commission and the World Food Program. The European Economic Commission and the World Food Program gave India a bunch of money to go and extract biomass from the forests of India, turn that into milk, and sell the milk in the cities. They told them, you know, if you do that, 
there's a lot of people who want to drink the milk okay then you can sell the milk and make money and then you can sell the beef and you can export it because indians don't eat beef so you can export it and make money and with that money you can then go buy fossil fuels because you can only buy fossil fuels with dollars and to get dollars you have to have something that people who eat who who are in europe want europe and north america want so this is what i call you know you ask why are why are the europeans you know promoting dairy consumption in india more than half of indians can't even digest dairy they can't they're lactose normal 65% of the world population is lactose normal so it's the europeans who had this genetic mutation that allowed them to digest dairy even after infancy okay uh, digest lactose even after in infancy so they are taking their food which they are able to digest and imposing it on other people saying eat that eat that is good for you that is colonialism 2.0 that is colonialism 2.0 and that's what's been happening okay so through this mechanism through the mechanism of the economic structures the currency mechanism we are still subjugating the global south we are still extracting from the global south in fact the estimate is that we are ex extracting the global north is extracting 2 to 3 trillion dollars worth of resources from the global south every year through these mechanisms and that's colonialism 2.0 and colonialism and carnism are just two sides of the same coin so eating animals eating animal foods is directly connected with colonialism is directly connected with capitalism it's all one single oppression that's happening okay and nature is telling us it's over stop that get real and that's what climate change is because human activities have done a lot of damage to the biosphere the eco the um, atmosphere and and the hydrosphere of the planet mainly through deforestation so you think about this forest i mean this desert from the western edge of africa goes all the way into india and becomes the thar desert goes all the way into china and becomes the gobi gobi desert it is one contiguous desert and that's where the ancient civilizations of the world were so this colonialism is nothing new it's been happening for thousands of years it's just that now it happens to be headed by some european people okay otherwise it was other, we were all doing it to each other as human beings and the poor animals <laughs> were at the bottom of it and they were bearing the brunt of all this okay and so through animal agriculture we con converted forests into deserts fundamentally and if you look at what is happening today to the land of the planet okay, uh, the ipcc has broken it up and showed you showed us how much land is being used for different purposes this is uh, urban land there's irrigated crop land and you can see all these you know bar graphs showing this i said okay i'm going to take the bar graphs and put that on the map to show you what the equivalent would be and here is what it is okay so the i'm leaving the deserts where they are so the, this is the desert that i showed you before and plant foods would cover pretty much uh Af australia and that constitutes 85% of the food we eat already so already 85% of the food we eat comes from just land area that can be fit inside australia okay and that's all the plant foods we eat now 12% of the food we eat is is land animal foods and to get that we are using land that would cover all of europe almost all of asia and a little bit of africa this red blob okay it's actually 43% of the land area of the planet we use just to graze and feed our animals this rest of africa would correspond to biofuels which again they call it biofuels <laughs> because we are growing we are growing all this uh, vegetation and then burning it okay? instead of taking fossil fuels and we think that that's better than burning fossil fuels it's actually worse because this biofuel region could have been a forest right all of built land urban land can fit inside madagascar and then 
timberland would cover most of North America and most of Central America, all of Central America and a little bit of South America. The original forests are just 9% of the ice-free land area of the planet and they can be fit in the bottom half of South America. So timberland wild animals cannot live because it's just monocultured of trees. Wild animals cannot live where our, our domestic animals live because you'll kill them if they come near our domestic animals. They don't live in deserts much. They don't grow, live in our cropland. So the only place where they are allowed to live are here, original forests. So this is why wild animal populations have been decimated compared to what they were 10,000 years ago. Now to get the remaining 3% of the food we eat, we are actually destroying the entire ocean. Okay, we are actually bottom trawling the ocean. We are, I mean, we just the devastation in the ocean is worse than what you're doing on land. So this abuse of the earth has got to stop. That's the signal that we're getting from other nature and that is climate change. This is why I say, you know, see, climate change, we can see that as something terrifying or something that is telling us to wake up. It's a wake up call. Between 1970 and 2010, we wiped out 52% of wild animals, wild vertebrates, by weight. So that's what we have been doing to the biosphere of the planet. And that, when, I, when that report came out in 2014, I did an extrapolation based on the assumption that the rate at which we are killing wild animals is proportional to the size of our economy. And that showed that by 2026, we are on track to wipe them all out. And I was so shocked. I said, what, 100% by 2026? That cannot be true. Why isn't everybody screaming about this if that's true? So I thought maybe my calculations are wrong, you know, so I'm going to wait till the next report comes out. And that came out in 2016. And it said that between 1970 and 2012, we wiped out 58%. So from 52, it went to 58 in just two years. So then I realized 2026 is real. Okay, we are on track to wipe out 100% of wild vertebrates by 2026. And that evening, I was reading a story to my granddaughter in bed. And at the end of the story, she asked me, uh, Grandpa, who are the first human beings? And I have promised her that I'll never, ever lie to her. Because I think lying to children should be a crime against humanity. And I made that pledge because I realized that I had been lied to as a child about the protein myth, the calcium myth, I mean, all these myths that we were taught in school. And I was so upset about that, okay? So I told her I will never ever lie to you. And so when she asked me that question, I told her, okay, I'm going to explain to you how evolution works. Imagine that you're standing on the street and you're holding your mama by your hand. When you ask your mama to bring her mama to stand by her side and so on, and you create a long line of mothers on this side of the street. And on the other side of the street, you ask a chimpanzee to do the same thing with her mother and her grandmother and so on. By the time these two lines go from Phoenix to Tucson, they would merge because both lines are going to say, hey, that's my mama too. Immediately, she just sat up in bed and she said, what? Are you telling me that animals are my family? And I said, yeah, now that you put it that way, they are your family. And she said, then, 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 then why are people eating my family? Grandpa, make them stop. They're eating my family. She started bawling. You know, and it was my job to put her to bed. And, and I had this five-year-old, instead of you know, going to sleep, screaming at me and yelling. And, and I told her, Kimaya, you know, I'm trying. Honey, I'm really trying. In fact, it's my job to make them stop. So immediately she stopped crying. She looked at me wide-eyed. She said, this is your job? This is your job? You know you haven't done your job? When will you do your job? She started demanding. She said, when will, when will you do your job? And I told her, I better do it by 2026. Otherwise, we're all in big trouble. She said, will you promise me that? I said, yeah, sure, I'll promise you that. She said, will you give me a pinky promise? I said, sure, I'll give you a pinky promise. And I had no idea what it meant. She said, hold out your pinky. And I did. 
And she locked her pinky in mine and then she said, you can never ever break a pinky promise. And then she went to sleep. And I couldn't sleep. Because I realized I had made a very serious promise to a little girl. And I thought at first, who am I to make this promise on behalf of all, all human beings? And, but then I finally dozed off, you know, and I woke up in the morning realizing that as a systems engineer, it's my job to figure out how to do it. It's my job to show you what we need to do in the system to transform from where we are to where we need to be. So that's when I started the Vegan World 2026 project. And I went around talking about this to people. Now, the Living Planet reports come out every two years. So the Living Planet report of 2020 is the latest one we have. And it said that between 1970 and 2016, 68% of wild animals died out. So we are on, still on track to hit 100% by 2026. So it is urgent that we get to a vegan world by 2026. Okay? A global transformation is inevitable. It's going to happen whether we like it or not. I don't give a damn if people are sitting around playing golf and the fires are behind them. They are going to get that fire on their heads sooner or later, and they're going to have to wake up. The global transformation, is, this is why it's absolutely inevitable. And it's mainly because of the pervasive human-driven decline of life. Beyond climate change, it is the, the decline of life points to the need for transformative change. Because if that life dies, we are going to die. So as simple as that. So are you smart enough to figure that out? That's the question that nature is asking us. Are you smart enough to figure out that when you kill all the wild animals, you're going to die? If you're smart enough to figure that out, then stop it. And why are we doing this? Because we have built an entire industrial civilization on a couple of false axioms. <laughs> an axiom is a truth that we take for granted. We know it's the truth because, you know, we, it's just part of our lives. We think that's true. So I say that uh, there are two false axioms in our civilization today. This is just like when Galileo said, you know, the sun does not go around the earth. The earth goes around the sun. Everybody got mad at him, right? They threw him in jail. But only after you acknowledge that he was right, that we could have had the scientific revolution happen. Until then, there was no way you could have had a scientific revolution. There is no theory of gravity pretending that the sun goes around the earth. Okay? Newton would not have been able to do what he did. So there would have been no mechanics, no quantum mechanics. None of this stuff would have happened if he hadn't acknowledged that Galileo was right. That the earth goes around the sun and not the other way around. By the way, Galileo figured that out and Copernicus figured that out in the 15th century in Europe. This is a well-known fact in India. It was, it was known well before that, okay? So it's just, this is all Eurocentrism to saying, oh, it, we discovered it in 1600 or whatever that, you know, it's 1500. Uh, this is Eurocentrism, okay? There is a lot of knowledge that we already had as human beings, as a human family that got rediscovered over and over. So anyway, leave that as it may. The current industrial civilization is based on a couple of false axioms. The first false axiom is the false axiom of consumerism, which is that the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by stoking and satisfying a never-ending series of latent desires, which is what I call the greed is good rule. Okay. Now, there is not a single religion on this planet that says greed is good. Not one. And yet, we have built an entire civilization on the assumption that greed is good. And why do I say it's a false, it's an axiom? Because we see 3,000 ads a day and we don't even blink an eye because we think it's normal. And all our models are built on the assumption that everybody is going to consume more and more and more given the opportunity. This is what I call the infinite consumption model. Everybody is trying to consume as much as Jeff Bezos. Everybody wants to go to space just like Jeff Bezos, right? That's the kind of model they, that we have built. And by the way, I mean, it's there in all academia. They're, they're actually studying this model, infinite consumption model. MIT did the infinite consumption model in 1972. 
So this false axiom is built into our civilization and it has to be overturned. If we don't overturn it, there is no such thing as a sustainability revolution. You will never have sustainability as long as we believe this false axiom of consumerism. And the second is the false axiom of supremacism. So which is that life is a competitive game in which those who have gained an advantage may possess, enslave, and exploit animals, nature, and the disadvantage for their pursuit of happiness. This is what I call the might is right rule. And again, there is not a single religion on this planet that says the might is right. Not one. And yet, we have built an entire civilization on might is right, okay? on the false axiom of supremacism. And why do I say that? Because it's evidenced in all the slaughterhouses we have around us. It's evidenced in all the slave labor we have around us. It's evidenced in, you know, in the child labor that's happening in Congo. I mean, look at the wars that have been happening in Congo and all the colonialism that's going on, the racism that's going on. That is the false axiom of supremacism. Our civilization is built on that. So these are two false axioms. And so this is why I say we are in a double Galileo moment in human history. There are two fundamental axioms that we have to overturn if we really want to have a sustainability revolution happen. And to implement these two false axioms, we have built two huge machines. First is the burning machine, which is constantly churning out more and more products. And we have planned obsolescence and all this stuff that we put in, in our products. Two, implement the false axiom of consumerism, the infinite consumption model. Okay? So that's the burning machine. And that's the fossil fuel machine. So it runs mostly on fossil fuels, this machine. And it makes you go buy new cell phones every, every six months, you know, that sort of stuff, right? And so this is the false axiom of consumerism that's implemented by the burning machine. The second is the killing machine that implements the false axiom of supremacism. In this killing machine, we are killing over 80 billion land animals and one to three trillion sea animals, not to mention billions of trees and billions, I mean, millions of human beings through diseases and chronic diseases and, uh, and hunger related causes. So this killing machine is driving the destruction of the planet in addition to the burning machine. Okay, so both of these have to be shut down if we really want to have a sustainable civilization. Definitely the killing machine has to be shut down. The burning machine, you have to shrink it and make it run on renewable energy. Now that's what we need to do. But the way it is being framed today is that they're framing it as a, don't look at the killing machine. That's not the problem. We just need to change the fuel for the burning machine and we can keep growing it more and more and more. So this is a system that says, I don't want to change my axioms. I want to continue running a false axiom of consumerism and the false axiom of supremacism. I want to continue running this colonial system that I'm in, that we are in, uh, but we'll just change the fuel for it. So that's why, that's how they're directing us, they're misdirecting our attention. They're saying, don't look at genetic diversity and, and the loss of wild animals. Don't look at the nitrogen and phosphorus loading of the planet. Don't look at all these other things because all these other things are caused by the black dots here correspond to the killing machine. The killing machine is the leading cause of all these other things. They're saying, focus just on climate change. Because that's the only problem you need to worry about because there they have made it look like it's the burning machine that's the leading cause. So this is why in all of our media, we only hear about climate change. We don't hear about the loss of wild animals. Okay, not as much. Because they're trying to frame the story as a story of just changing the fuel for the burning machine and to leave everything else alone. This is why the climate change meetings have been absolutely ineffective. I went to the one in Glasgow and I can tell you that they are not going to solve climate change the way they did. They had ticker tapes with, with sponsors, corporate sponsors for the climate change meeting. Okay? They had this huge uh, globe 
hanging over us. And they spent like a hundred million, hundred million pounds just on security for this thing. And what did they do at the end of that? They all had a party and then they left. And if you look at the UN Sustainable Development Goals, you can see how it is being framed in a way to preserve the system. Sustainable Development Goals. I mean, the goals are great, okay? No poverty, zero hunger. How can you argue with that? Good health and well-being, quality education. We want all that. And then they went and stuck goal number eight. Goal number eight is decent work and economic growth. And you ask yourself, why is that there? If I have no poverty and zero hunger on this planet and good health and well-being for every human being, do I really care that some economy is growing somewhere? So it's a redundant goal. A redundant goal is usually put in order to mask the other goals. That's what they do in systems, okay? So they put this redundant goal in there and then they pretend to meet all the other goals by just growing the economy. Why are they doing this? Because they're running a Ponzi scheme. That's what they're doing. They're running a Ponzi scheme. These are all the Bernie Madoffs of the planet. Okay? They're running a global ecological Ponzi scheme, uh, which is based on growing. So all Ponzi schemes collapse if they don't grow. So you have to grow it. So how do you grow? The current growth formula is to monetize everything so that when uh, dead animals have more economic value than living animals, you kill the animals. When dead trees are more economic value than living trees, you chop down the trees. When sick people are more economic value than healthy people, we sicken people. Okay. Uh, you endanger life on earth through such biological annihilation and climate change and pandemics. You addict everyone into compulsive behaviors because you want people to keep consuming more and more and more and to buy into this infinite growth formula. That's how you're growing the economy. So you addict everyone into compulsive behaviors. You deliberately put candy in the, in, at the eye level for children so that they get suckered into eating it. We lie to ourselves about the protein myth, the calcium myth, you know, the climate change. I mean, all, there's so many lies, so many deceptions, more than lies, it's more like deceptions, right? They don't tell you the whole truth. They just tell, they shade the truth so that you get, you mis, you get misled into going the wrong way. And finally, in this economy, we steal from the poor to enrich the rich. So we have created these rules. We are actually playing a game. And in the game, we have created rules that when resources flow up the hierarchy, you are, you are welcome to take as much profit as you can. It's called profit. And you are celebrated for taking more profit. So I went and bought basmati rice for $2 at the supermarket here in Phoenix. And then I traced the rice back to the, to the woman who grew it. And I found out that she got paid five cents a pound for that same rice. So what happened to the other $1.95? Well, it was profit for Jeff Bezos and Whole Foods, right? And whoever shipped the rice from India to, to here, they took it. They took the rest. They stole it from her. But they call it profit when you do that. On the way down, if I send resources from Phoenix to India and I give $2 in donation to, say, uh, World Food Program or something like that, and if I discover that only five cents went to the people and the other $1.95 was taken away by the charity, I get mad, right? And I call it theft. And we take those people who did that and throw them in jail. So this is how we ensure that money always flows up. There is a huge sucking sound, right? That's, you're sucking stuff up to the top only. So this is the top-down money flow in the game. The game itself is rigged. It's rigged so that you steal from the poor to enrich the rich. This is why I look at all the money I have stored in the back and I say, that's not mine. That money I stole from some poor person somewhere and some animal somewhere. And therefore, it's my responsibility to use that money to free them. So that's how I treat my, all, all my savings now. Okay, it's Because the game of money, the way it is set up, is designed to suck resources from the bottom and funnel it to the top, funnel money to the top. 
because when you deposit $100 in the bank, only $10, the bank, the bank is allowed to keep only $10 and loan out the other $90. Loan out the other $90 in return for interest on the loans. So you get interest back on the loans and you have to, you are asked to give the principal back. And if that $90 is put back in the bank, they keep $9, loan out $81. So you can see as you do more and more of this, that $100 is still there in the bank, except you have made like $900 in fake money and given it out as loans. So that's how the money supply grows in the system. Now, suppose once you borrow money from the bank, you go to the bank and say, I'm so sorry, I had a flood in my home, you know, and I can't pay back the money. Guess what? They are going to come and take away all your assets and give it to the bank. So in a dispute between the bank and the individual, the state always sides with the bank. So this is how the colonial system is sucking wealth from the bottom to the top. This is the colonial game of empire that we have been playing. Okay? Um, if you look at all the big corporations, the big pharma, big meat, big chem, big media, big banks, big oil, big defense, you will see the same four financial holding companies in the, as major stockholders. Fidelity, Vanguard, State Street, and BlackRock. And if you trace these four financial holding companies to see who really owns them, it's very opaque. Okay, so you finally reach this private holding company and that private holding company does not have to disclose its shareholders. So some unknown set of people somewhere are controlling the entire planet. Okay? And we are pretending to have democracy. We're pretending to fight each other. In reality, they're all being paid by the same people. So it's a, it's a game we are playing. And it's a game that's destroying the planet because it's based on false axioms. And so we can deduce who these people are based on the kind of social injustice we see. Because we have a system that's based on domination of the planet, domination of nature, and death for the animals, diseases for human beings, and destruction for the planet, the four Ds. And if you look at the speciesism that's there, the colonialism that's there, the racism that's there, and the sexism that's there in, in our society, we can deduce that the people who are running the planet of primarily old white European men. Now, it had been run by um, young female chimpanzees from Africa, you would have the exact opposite, you know, social injustices. So it's not the, the people that matter, it's the rules of the game. The rules of the game set it up to be like this, okay? And it causes us to tell lies to each other or to deceive, deceive each other. So there is an impact on the language and on the science as well. So there is constant misplaining going on in our language. There's a constant misplaining going on even in our science. There is Eurosplaining going on. There is white splaining going on. There's mansplaining going on. Okay, and it's all because we are trying to get this infinite consumption model to keep going. And everyone is desperate to keep their their corporation growing, right? So. We meet plane, Euros plane, white plane, and man's plane routinely. We have the four deadly dietary deceptions. Like Dr. John McDougall has that in his um, website, mcdougallfoundation.org. The protein deception, the calcium deception, the omega 3 deception, the carb deception. These are deceptions, meaning they're not lies. They just tell you protein meat, protein meat, so that you associate protein with meat. They do that in their textbooks. It never occurs to you to question whether protein is found in other things. The same with calcium milk, calcium milk, they associate it. And omega-3 fish, omega-3 fish, you know, they associate it. So that psychologically, you're deceived into thinking that that's the only source of calcium, the only source of omega-3. And finally, they teach you that carbs will make you fat. Okay? That's a lie. It's a lie because they want you to eat more animal foods. And why do they want you to eat more animal foods? Because that's how you grow the economy. That's how you grow the colonial system. That's how you extract wealth from more and more areas of the planet and funnel it to a few people at the top. So the same 
you know, there are four deadly climate deceptions and which, which we unveiled in our animal agriculture position paper. There are four deadly climate deceptions that also are designed to make you stop looking at animal agriculture and just look at fossil fuels. Okay? So it's a, it's a framing that they do. And the first is the CO2 deception. They tell you that CO2, once you put it into the atmosphere, the carbon dioxide will stay there forever. In fact, 20 to 40% of it will stay there for thousands of years, according to the IPCC. And you ask yourself, is that really true? What are the assumptions to make that true? It turns out the assumptions to make that true are that you're going to continue deforesting the planet for thousands of years. And I can assure you that if we continue deforesting the planet for thousands of years, we are going to be dead. In fact, forget thousands of years. If we continue deforesting the planet for the next decade, two decades, we're going to be dead. So does it really matter that CO2 will stay in the atmosphere for thousands of years if we continue deforesting the planet for thousands of years? What if we start reforesting the planet? How long will CO2 stay up in the atmosphere? It turns out it doesn't stay that long because it gets sucked down by the trees. So the CO2 deception is, the, is fundamental to what they're doing. They're pretending that you cannot stop animal agriculture. Second is the methane deception. And that is connected to the CO2 deception. So they average the impact of methane over 100 years and pretend that CO2 will last for thousands of years. And this is why methane, the impact of methane keeps falling in the calculations. If methane and CO2 only last in the atmosphere for 20 years, then methane will always be 130 times more powerful than CO2. Always, no matter what average you look at, okay? So by tweaking this, they make the methane look more benign than it is. Even though in reality, on an annual basis, methane causes three times more heating than CO2. So it's the number one gas you need to be addressing but they want to mask that, make you look at just CO2 because they want you to well, just focus on fossil fuels and ignore animal agriculture. The third is the land use deception. Land use deception is to take the net of the deforestation and the afforestation. The afforestation, how does that happen? Because you abandon the land. Because you said, oh, it's much easier to go and deforest some land and use that for grazing our animals because there's not enough grass growing on this land that the animals were using before. So you abandon some land, and on that land, nature is desperately trying to recover. So they take the net of the two, and then use that to calculate land use impact. And they only look at the land use impact as it happens today, not this year. They ignore all the land use impact that happened over the last 8,000 years. They ignore that. They pretend that that's a given. That's the way land is supposed to be. So that's the land use deception. And that is related to the timeline deception. The timeline deception is to tell you, oh, climate change only started happening 200 years ago. Therefore, we can ignore everything that happened before to, for 1800. That's a deception. Because if you take into account what happened from 8,000 years ago on, you will discover that animal agriculture was the leading cause of climate change. And that's the paper we wrote. Okay? It's the leading cause of climate change. And we had press conferences at the UN talking about this. No one wanted to hear it, but I wasn't, I wasn't going to stop me. So I went and had five press conferences. We had balloons of animals. Uh, the animals, the four animals represented four aspects of animal agriculture that's impacting the planet. Uh, the cow represented um, climate change. The pig represented obesity and uh, diseases, chronic diseases. The chicken had a mask on her, so she represented pandemics. And then the fish represented microplastics. I don't know if you can see the fish here. Anyway, that's a fish balloon there. We got some mainstream publicity for doing that. Finally, got into the Guardian. We're talking about why is no one talking about farming at COP26? We talked about the cow in the room. We had a big article on that. Methane is a greenhouse gas that causes climate change. 
life on earth is collapsing. So it comes from me. But it's not my fault, it's yours. Feed us new tear down forests to create new grazing land, but we need trees to capture greenhouse gases. The climate disaster is human made, not cow made. But you can slow it. You can stop it. Well, stop eating me. A plant based diet is good for all us animals and the climate. You can make a difference. Transform to a plant based diet. So that's the uh, animation that we showed at COP26 in Glasgow in November. So we unveiled Biga the cow and we used her to send the message to people that there is a way to solve climate change, it requires us to eat plants, plant trees, love animals, and you can heal the planet. So simple. And we had a bathtub analogy to explain why you have to also look at the killing machine. And I felt like you know, I was dealing with elementary school kids instead of scientists, right? These grown scientists refusing to look at animal agriculture, focusing just on fossil fuels. Uh, it's, it's like, are you out of your mind? So I was telling them, you know, look at, look at what's happening in the atmosphere based on your own numbers. There's 1,000 liters of water in the bathtub that corresponds to 1,000 gigatons of CO2 that we are putting into the atmosphere. And we are saying, okay, we are adding 35 liters per minute, which corresponds to the 35 gigatons per year of CO2 that we are adding into the atmosphere from the burning machine, from the fossil fuel burning machine. So I'm using their own conventions. And I said, pointed out to you, their own conventions are all jiggered to make it look like the killing machine is less, I mean, more benign than it is. Okay. So using their own numbers, 35 liters per minute is from the burning machine. 15 liters per minute is from the killing machine. That's 15 lit gigatons per, uh, per year of CO2 equivalent. That's directly caused by the killing machine. But then the killing machine is also blocking the drain of the bathtub. So it's preventing 30 liters per minute from flowing from the bathtub into, into the vegan reforestation tank. It's clogged up by all the hamburgers that we're eating. That's all the land that you could have returned back to nature and brought back the forest on that land. That would have started sequestering at least 30 gigatons of CO2 per year, okay, according to my calculations. Now, the burning machine is also connected to the aerosol tank. So that's the cooling gases that we put into the atmosphere when we burn fossil fuels. And that cooling gases, they're actually masking about one third of the heating. So this is why it has 350 liters of water in the aerosol tank. So for every one liter per minute that you turn down the burning machine faucet, 10 liters is going to pour from the aerosol tank into the bathtub because that heating will come back and bite us in the rear end if we don't take care of it. Okay? So this is the bathtub problem. And I say, you're a, you're a plumber and you have these two faucets putting water into the bathtub. And I ask you, how are you going to turn down, shut down these two faucets and save the baby without overflowing the vegan reforestation tank? Can you do it? Okay. So it's actually a problem that any engineering student should be able to solve. And any plumber should be able to solve. And any plumber will tell you that if you have two faucets pouring water into a bathtub, you need to shut them both off. Not just one. So in the problem, I say that if the bathtub is more than 1,200 liters of water, the baby is going to drown. Now you could argue whether it's 1,200 or 1,250 or 1,150 or whatever, but somewhere in the baby is going to drown if you keep increasing the CO2 levels in the atmosphere. So then I show, okay, there are two, I show you the optimum solution. The optimum solution requires us to shut down the killing machine as soon as possible, right away. If you can do it right away, do it right away. And then the water level will go up to 1063 liters in the bathtub. And then we can drain the bathtub. So we can solve climate change, folks, if we know what we're doing.
So, but for a lot of time, for about 30 years, the bathtub will have 1063 liters of water. Okay, so, so which means we are going to have some problems to deal with as we bring back the forest. But the baby will thrive eventually. After 30 years, the baby will start thriving because the temperature will be back down and you know and we'll be fine, right? So that's according to this model. Now, that's the optimum solution. Now, suppose you say, oh no, you know, it's gonna take us five years to wake up and turn the world vegan. Let's say we are like total tube lights of a species, right? So it takes us five years to wake up that we are in danger. Then the water level will go up to 1195 liters. So the baby barely survives. And it will be there at 1195 liters for 30 years. But you can still solve it, but it's going to be a lot harder. And it's going to be a lot harder for everybody. So that's because it took us five years to wake up and say, okay, we need to stop killing animals. And that is not a very smart species, by the way, that takes five years to figure that out. So, as I said, my granddaughter has been my, one of my greatest teachers. Uh, when she was four years old, she insisted that I go take her to Cinderella, to watch Cinderella. And because I was babysitting her at that time. And I thought, oh, you know, it's for her, I'm going to take her to see a movie that she wants to see. And within 10 minutes, I realized the movie was for me, not for her. Because I sat up in my seat when I heard Cinderella say, have courage, be kind, and all will be well. That's what her mother taught her, apparently. And that, by the way, encapsulates everything we need to do as a species. We have to have courage to be kind. It takes courage to be kind when everyone is unkind around you, when cruelty is the norm. It takes courage to be, it takes courage to be a vegan. But if everyone has the courage to be kind, all will be well. Second thing she said was, just because it is what is done, doesn't mean it is what should be done. And that's the second principle that we need to adopt today. Just because we have been doing something all along, doesn't mean you have to continue doing the same thing. Just because we have been pretending that the sun goes around the earth, doesn't mean you have to continue pretending that the sun goes around the earth. When you know better, right? So just because... We have, been, we have been following the axiom of supremacism and the axiom of consumerism for the last 10,000 years. Doesn't mean you have to continue following the same axioms of supremacism and consumerism forever. Because if you do, you're going to be dead. So that's the transformation that needs to happen. And then we need to imagine the world as it should be and act for it, as opposed to the world as it is. What do you want the world to be? Do you want the world to have to be full of wild animals, and nature thriving, then work for it. We can make that happen. We have to organize around that. So as Buckminster Fuller said, you never change things by fighting the existing reality. To change something, build a new model that makes the existing model obsolete. And that's the approach that I'm take, we are taking as well at Climate Healers. We are saying, let's create a new model that is not that separate from the old model in which it is based on the correct axioms and in which people are going to thrive. So this is the two loops model of Barkana Institute. Barkana Institute has this two loops model where we are in the climate heating phase and it's based on the axiom of supremacism and the axiom of consumerism. Okay, And we have heated the planet up. We're doing a really good job of it, heating it up. And now it is chaotic here because you can't really keep doing this over and over. You know, and we are going to die if we keep doing it uh, for the next <laughs> decade even. So then a lot of people are peeling off of this saying, oh, this is no good. And they're going vegan. This is what I call the vegan contagion model. This is a, veganism is like a contagion, right? So you go and tell others and they go vegan because of what you told them. And so it's an infection. You infect people. And it's a good contagion to have. And as more and more people go vegan, you need to organize around this. So we have the trailblazers who have to create a new loop, a new model, a new model that's not based on infinite consumption. It's based on finite consumption. 
and it's based on regenerating the planet. So that's the climate, climate healing model that we need to create, that we are working on right now. Okay, So we need to create that. And then as it grows, in the 30 years or so, we can be, reach the climate harmonizing phase. So that's what I want to hand over to my granddaughter and say, it's your job to maintain the climate forever okay? and thrive on this planet. Now, what happens in this model is that when the sum of the GDP, the GDP of the old and the new, when that stops growing, the old will collapse. Why? Because it's a Ponzi scheme. Ponzi schemes collapse and it doesn't grow. Okay? People just withdraw their money saying, oh my God, you know, it's not growing anymore. So when that collapses, the eliminators are going to show them, you know, get on this ladder and come over here and join us. So then this grows. This becomes the, the dominant system. So this is the transformation, a modeling of the transformation from the caterpillar to the butterfly. And COVID-19 has put us in the chrysalis phase of humanity. Okay? Basically, COVID-19 is Mother Nature telling us, you know, go to your room and stay there and think about what you've done and come out as a more enlightened species. And the correct axioms, so the new system has to be based on the true axiom of inner peace, which is the pursuit of happiness is best accomplished by seeking it within ourselves, which is what we call the self-mastery rule or the finite consumption model. And there are lots of people living according to this. Okay? It's not nothing new. And it's something that we have known for thousands of years. Our religion is full of this, right? Looking for inner peace. And the second is the true axiom of unity. Instead of the axiom of supremacism, it's the true axiom of unity, which is that all life is one family where we each bring our unique skills to give all we can, receive all we need, and become all we are. Because every animal has a role to play. Every human being has a role to play. We all have gifts that we can give. And we actually have the capacity to give more than we take. And when we all start giving more than we take, the planet thrives because we are contributing to the planet than we are taking from it. This is the metamorphosis analogy. And to me, it is the greatest transformation in human history that has ever happened. And we are here at this time to execute on this. Okay? We are the only generation that has the capacity to do it, that has the strength to do it, and we are the only generation that has the opportunity to do it. Because if we don't do it, the future generations are going to be dead. Okay, so we have that. We have this opportunity. And I'm saying, we are on this ledge, okay, high up in the mountain. On either side, you see huge falls. But there is a path towards the light that we can take. And I want to focus on that path. Because, and, I, and I don't want to hear anyone you know, behind me telling me how many bones I'm going to break if I fall on either side. This is why I just focus on the path and I say, what is the next step I need to do? What do I need to do next? Right? So, so this greatest transformation is, requires four cultural shifts and seven civilizational shifts, seven major civilizational shifts. The cultural shifts are from normalized violence to normal nonviolence, meaning slaughterhouses cannot be normal anymore in the new system. Shut them all down. There is no normalized violence. It's normal non-violence. Non-violence in our dealings with each other, no bullying, you know, none of that stuff. Right? Instead of playing competitive finite games in which there is one winner and all the rest are losers, that's the kind of games we play now. And we play games with the, using the skin of animals, right? So we bat around a, uh, a baseball made from the skin of cows. So it's as if we are telling the animals, hey, look who's the boss around here. See, we are so strong. We can kill you, we take your skin and use it to play games, amuse ourselves. So we play all these competitive finite games. Instead, we should be playing collaborative infinite games. Games in which there are no winners and losers. And the object of the game is to continue the game. Okay, because that's what sustainability is. Sustainability is about infinite games, not finite games. Because we want to stay on this planet forever. Not just see who's the winner, who gets to go to Mars, 
fun. Now all the rest are going to die. That's not the game you want to play. We have to transition from a predator species to a caretaker species. Now, I'm pointing out to you that before we mastered fire, before we had control of fire, we were the prey species, not a predator species. We were easy to catch. You know, you don't run too fast. You don't climb trees too well. You don't have big claws. You don't have, you can't even hear too well. Can't even see too well. So we were easy to catch. We were a prey species. And that's what forced us to come up with weapons and to protect ourselves. And then we became stronger and stronger and stronger and we became a predator species. Now we are the top predator on the planet. Okay, but from that we need to become a caretaker species because if we don't, we're going to die. So, and that requires us to have a new name. We call ourselves Homo sapiens sapiens, you know, the wise, wise hominid. I mean, I've never had this level of narcissism in, in, because, because we are the ones naming ourselves. We call ourselves the wise, wise hominid. And I suggest that we adopt uh, Judy Carmen's name that she's come up with for us. It's called Homo Ahimsa, which is a combination of a Latin word and a Sanskrit word. So it symbolizes that we are coming together as a species from around the globe. And it describes our character because Ahimsa means nonviolence. We are fundamentally nonviolent. And the civilizational shifts are from, from all the isms, speciesism, colonialism, racism, ableism, and patriarchy, from a domination oppression paradigm, to veganism and radical sacredness, treating all life as sacred, all beings as sacred. This is the Ahimsa sacred relationships paradigm. From diseases and divisiveness among humanity to health and harmony in diversity among humanity, taking care of each other, okay? instead of fighting with each other, instead of having war all over the place and you know, making money of, uh, of diabetes, making money of heart disease and things like that to making sure that everyone is healthy, give everyone healthy food. So that's the transition that needs to happen. From destruction and exploitation of the planet to regeneration and caretaking of the planet. We need to start giving more than we take from the planet. Only then will the planet thrive. And we are capable of it, okay? We are perfectly capable of doing this. It's just that we need a different organization, different way of, of relating to each other, different game we need to be playing. From violence and cruelty to animals, to kindness and compassion for animals. Animals are here with us, not for us. They are with us and they each have something important to contribute. And we know that we've already wiped out 7 to 13% of all species on this planet. So it's time to stop the killing machine. I mean, as soon as possible. Because it's like saying 7 to 13% of your organs are gone. And you, are you feeling healthy? I mean, you lost your liver, you lost your gallbladder. I mean, is that, is that good? So it's time to stop. Okay. So from violence and cruelty to animals to kindness and compassion for animals. From an egocentric culture of consumerism and celebrating the guy who has stolen the most. That's what we do today. Celebrate the people who have stolen the most and who are consuming the most. From that, we need to shift to a culture of accountability an ecocentric culture of accountability. We all have a role to play. We all have responsibilities. We have a responsibility as a species. As soon as we admit it, that we are changing the climate of the planet, we have the responsibility to harmonize the climate of the planet. And from a mindset of scarcity to a mindset of generosity. Okay? So it needs to be built into the game we are playing, the generosity. Because right now we have scarcity built into the game we are playing because you start off by saying no one gets anything, right? So you start off with zero. And then we, we are told, you know, you have to go earn a living. I mean, think about that. We tell everyone the creator gave you the right to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then we tell the children as they grow up, you have to go earn a living. What happened to the creator given, God given right to life? 
Why do we have to earn a living if I already have a God-given right to life? So we got conned, right? Into being, into being colonized to do what the master wants. From a profit to an economy to a service to an economy. An economy that's built around service to others. Service to other beings and to ourselves, to other human beings. So this is the greatest transformation in human history. It's, I mean, it's mind-boggling, you know, but that we could be living in this new paradigm as opposed to the one that we are in. Because everything on, everything on the left-hand side is built into the, the game of money that we are playing today. Okay? And I don't see anything there that I want to preserve. So we have to create a new game of money, a, game, a new game of currencies, that allow us to do everything on the right-hand side automatically. And that's what I call the vegan currency. So we have to create a vegan currency, uh, Aquarius, a multidimensional measure of ecological footprint. And this could be based on just earth, air, fire, water. You have limits on how much earth you can use, how much fire you can use, how much water you can use, and how much air you can use. Okay, so, and the cost of a product is going to be determined by the ecological footprint in these things. And, and then you get allowances that flow from the bottom up as opposed to top down. So this way, as it flows up the hierarchy, people know exactly where it came from. It came from the people, not from some, some emperor somewhere. No, it came from the people. People are the ones who are really serving you, right? So you're in service to people. So the currency flows from the bottom up as opposed to top down. And here, uh, the flow is the same for every individual. So this allows, it's like a heartbeat. Okay? It promotes a mindset of abundance and radical equality. And then some of it goes into the pocket of the account. So that means the individual can use it. And some of it goes into the heart of the community. And then the rest accumulates in the heart of the individual. It accumulates in the heart of the individual and, and as you do, you're able to tap into it in order to do acts of service to others. But if you don't do any acts of service, let's say someone sits around watching TV all day, then more and more from the heart will flow into the community's heart and therefore the community gets more from that individual. So it's essentially taxed, right? And then the community has the same kind of uh, architecture as the individual. And by doing that, and then you allow the community to make local decisions as to what they need to do about the water that's dirty or the trash that's there or whatever. So they can figure out what they want to use this for. But this can only be done in an open source economy and ecology in which everyone is contributing their knowledge for free. I'm giving my knowledge away for free. I'm not holding on to it because I can make money off of it. Okay? Because I see this as an engineering project. Like, just like in an engineering project, if I had 70, I had 70 members of my team when I was doing the internet. And if, if I had run it like the way they're running the economy today, <laughs> it wouldn't have worked. Okay? The, you wouldn't have an internet working. Right? If everyone is backbiting each other and saying, it's mine, that's mine, I'm not going to show you what I'm doing, you will not have any collaboration you'll not have any collaborative project working. So this can only be done in an open source economy and ecology in which we all come together as one humanity because we have to solve climate change together. We have to solve the biodiversity loss together. And it's about creating abundance on this planet. Here is a map of all the trees on this planet, density of trees. And you can see vast areas of the planet have no trees left. Why? Because we chop them down. Half the trees on the planet are gone. Okay, we chop them down. But if you bring back those trees, and if 0.2% of the trees that you plant are mature almond trees, those almond trees can replace all the dairy milk you're consuming this year. Just 0.2% of the trees have to be almond trees. So this is why I say it's about creating abundance. And you create food forests, and you create a planet full of uh, fruit and, you know, um, native ecosystems that are full of edible plants, you're going to create abundance on this planet. And when people feel secure, 
they automatically also have less children. So the seven strategic actions that I that we are doing at Climate Healers, number one is education. This presentation that I'm giving you is something that we go and give to other people, okay, to schools, colleges. I'm trying to give it to as many people I can, as I can do. And the second thing we are asking is we are petitioning the UN to drop SDG 8, which is economic growth, and replace it with SDG 18, which is Claire Smith uh, came up with this, and this is zero animal exploitation. So kick out SDG 8 and put SDG 18 instead. And if you did that, it will make all the other sustainable development goals easy to meet. And we can actually get serious about meeting them as opposed to pretending to meet them while just growing the economy. And when you have 17 goals to meet, you typically have to pick one goal and actually meet it. I mean, actually meet it, okay? So that's how I run projects. If I run an engineering project and I have 17 goals to meet, I pick one and I say, let's meet it, guys. Let's, let's get it done. And so I picked uh, goal number two, which is zero hunger. And I'm saying, let's do it. Let's solve zero hunger. Let's make sure that no one goes hungry on this planet. That will bring us together as a species to help feed everyone. And so uh, we have a specific initiative. I'm going to talk about that soon. Uh, but food healers, is the, that's the idea behind food healers, is to give everyone Make sure that everyone has access to healthy, immune-boosting vegan food so that everyone get, can get healthy. Because this is the oxygen mask rule, right? You have to put on your own oxygen mask first before you go help others. We have a planet that's dying. Before we go and help other beings on this planet, we have to first take care of our health as a species. We need to make sure that uh, human beings are, also, are fed well. then we have to come up with a new constitution to heal the planet. The old constitutions, the way we broke things up into nations, you know, I mean, these are lines drawn on a map by some colonial ruler from 200 years ago, and we're still sticking to those things. We need to figure out a different way of organizing ourselves so that it's centered around, you know, the ecosystems and the watersheds, natural boundaries, as opposed to artificial boundaries drawn by some, some fellow on a, with a ruler. Okay. And we need to then create this open source economy game and we need to start playing it. And when we start playing this with this open source economy game, eventually people will say, hey, I'd rather be there on, than over here to get oppressed. So they'll come along. And then we need to get the religions of the world together on this. Okay. Because the religions of the world are well organized at the grassroots. And the, we are all being conned. No religion ever said that consumerism, infinite consumerism is what we need to be all doing. No religion ever said that might is right. But we have been deceived into thinking that that's what it is. So we need to get the religions to wake up and say, come together, let's all, we are all talking about the same thing. We are all talking about healing the planet and taking care of all life and taking care of each other. So let's get together and do it. And finally, we have to have a new ecology creating food for us around the world. So those are the seven strategic actions uh, that we talk about during our convergences. And then specifically, on November 19th of this year, we're going to make this announcement on uh, April 24th. We're going to make a big press splash on this. Uh, we want to feed every human being on the planet a healthy vegan meal on that day. So this is the equivalent of the salt march that Gandhi did, right? He said, yeah, we're going to go make salt and we're going to eat it and we're not going to pay tax for it. So it was a defiance of the colonial system that he did. In the same way, the colonial system wants us to eat bad food and get sick. No, on this one day, we're going to make sure that everyone has access to healthy food. And everybody is going to eat. Okay, so let's make that happen on one day. And in the process of making that happen, we'll figure out all the infrastructure that we need to make it happen every week and then eventually every day. 
I really think that the grandmothers of the world should get together to make this happen. Okay. See, the, the women of the world, the vegan women should help make this happen because this is taking back the power from the patriarchs who are running the disease-ridden system that we are in today. And then we also meet every quarter. Uh, the next convergence is happening April 30th and May 1st. So I invite you all to join us. So just go to um, climatehealers.org slash v-cop and uh, join us. So we meet every quarter to talk about this. And this is to me the equivalent of the convergence of the parties that the UN is organizing, except we are doing something serious. So with that, I want to stop and thank you very much. Wow, <clears throat> where, um, I don't even know where do we where do we begin um, to say we're all filled with gratitude, not just for your presentation, but for your work and um, the heal movement and being a stand for us all. And I do mean us all. I, I just I don't know how to thank you on behalf of all of us. And um, thank you for this presentation, Dr. Rao. Um, we do have a few minutes for questions, if that's OK with you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, I'm so sorry that I didn't come for the first 15 minutes <laughs> no uh, no apologies necessary and uh we're just we're just again just a, a real privilege to have you and um before we jump into q a um obviously your movies are out there your books are out there where's the best place again if, if people just want to read your books where where should they go where's the best place well the books are available on climatehealers.org the entire text is there so both Perfect. my books excellent excellent thank you so much um so with that, yeah, let's let's jump into some Q&A. I want to make sure that everybody understands on our side how we go about that here. And so normally we don't take questions directly from the chat box, um, but we do ask people to raise their virtual hand. And so I already see a hand raised. For those of you that don't know how to raise your hand, uh, in your Zoom controls, you see different tabs. And one of those tabs is your reactions tab. And you click on that, you click raise hand, and we'll see your hands raised and we'll go ahead and call you by your first name and, and bring you in and unmute you from here. Um, by the way, you literally have Dr. Rao to thank for all of this happening <laughs> in terms of the internet that we're using right now. It's truly miraculous. Um, let's jump right in. We've got somebody named Joe and I know this guy. Welcome, Joe. Hi, um, gentlemen. Thank you for uh, your presentation. Um, <clears throat> I enjoyed you last night. I enjoyed listening to you today. Um, I would consider myself a lifelong plant-based, whole food, vegan. Um, and along the way, I've learned a lot. Um, what I've learned is you obviously have to give a lot. You, you said some important things about giving more than you take. That's really, really important. It's the only way, it's the only way this thing is going to survive. Um, but I, as an optimistic person, um, my observations um, are very disheartening um, of how people who consider themselves vegans um, cohabitate with the rest of the, shall we say, uh, scope of living um, a wholesome, holistic uh, lifestyle. So, um, I don't want to touch even upon things that were so obvious to me that what were, were shown during the pandemic and how vegans reacted to things and how they completely um, uh, ignored anything related to immune system and, and primarily from the vegan that came from the vegan uh, camp. Um, and that really disappointed me. But I'll put that aside for a moment because over the years, what I've seen is vegans um, are very myopic in the sense that it's either about animal rights or climate or, um, you know, or fashion or, you know, it's, it, it is a movement that is spiritually based in who you are. It's, it's as important as your breath. It's as important as, you know, uh, going to sleep at night. Um, so unless the movement elevates itself to a, I believe, a much higher vibration, um, it's kind of, um, 
you know, a, uh, a commoditized uh, thing that corporations are using and, and, and people are buying into. A vegan is a revolutionary act. Stop the presses. We say no to so many things that are destroying this planet, destroying health. And, and we've got to be uh, vocal about it. And we've got to be passionate. And we've got to be loving about it. So with that said, um, I, I'd like to get your take on some of my thoughts. Beautifully said. Thank you, Joseph. You know, really, you're absolutely right. It is a, it is a journey that we are all on. You know, we are all coming home to who we really are. That's the way I say it, because you know, when I ask someone, would you deliberately hurt an innocent animal unnecessarily? Everyone says, no, you would never do that, which means in their heart, they're already vegan. You know, most people are born like that. And so this is why uh, it's a journey home to who we are, but we are all at different stages in this journey. And it's up to us to help each other to get to that home plate, you know, for all of us. So, um, so it, it requires compassion. It requires knowing that everyone is in their, on their, in their own place and that uh, it's not up to us to judge them. But at the same time, it's up to us to point to them, point them to where they need to be, how they can improve and get, get over uh, and help get them to their destination. Beautifully said. And if I may even add, I, I, that's certainly my concern. Um, you know, when some folks out there may have read uh, Eckhart Tolle's book, The Power of Now. And he mm -hmm. talks about uh, the collective insanity that we're all a part of, right? So um, I, I guess, isn't that the ego? And it seems to me like that's the biggest thing we get to overcome is this collective ego to get on board with everything you've presented here today. And um, that's the challenge, that's the opportunity. But let's get on to our next question. And that is going to be Phineas. Uh, hi, Phineas, welcome. Oh, I'm sorry, I muted you by accident. Phineas, there you go. Welcome. Hello. Um, also on that point, I'm, I really want to spread information about whole foods and bringing health to people. Um, but I also don't want to um, cause them to stress, especially if they feel like the food is inaccessible to them. So I don't know how to, I, I want to find a way, I'm wondering how to balance um, spreading that information and not hurting other people. Thank you. Good question, Phineas. I mean, what we have been doing is to basically cook um, healthy meals and give it away to people who need it. Um, so this way, they don't have to think about it. They just, when you say free food, everyone shows up <laughs> and they eat it. And then they say, oh, it, it makes me feel good. I said, yeah, exactly. You know, it makes you feel good when you eat healthy food. Um, so they, then it becomes their own realization. Then they look at it and say, oh, there's not much to this. Yeah, it's not much to this. It's just putting some grains and some beans and some veggies together with some herbs and spices and that's it. Yeah. Thank you very much for that. Um, I also want to make sure we do have a few minutes left for Q&A. For those of you that aren't sure and if you might have missed it, um, all you need to do to raise your hand is click on your reactions tab. Once you click on your reactions tab, a couple of emojis pop up. One of them says raised hand. You click on that and we will see your hand raised. And let's go now to uh, Cheryl. Hi, Cheryl. Hello. Hi, welcome. Um, my question is, is there any, my question is, is there any website that we can go to for people to calculate their footprint? Yeah, there are lots of them. I, I, um, I Offhand, I don't. I can't tell you, but I can Google it and send you. I can send it to Steve and he can put it up on the website. Yeah. That would be great. There, there are lots of them actually on um, ecological footprint. Mostly, you know, the CO2 footprint um, websites, there are water footprint websites. So we also need a land use footprint website. You know, we need, we need to look at all the four of them, energy use, right? So it's earth, air, fire, water. <laughs> the four uh, elements yeah thank you very much for that and i see some folks are already starting to uh put some some sites in the chat for that uh if you want to take a look cheryl and so um <clears throat> let's go now to jane welcome jane thank you hi dr salish thank you for such a great presentation i just wondered if 
you could give a little more information about World Food Healers Day. Uh, I think it's a brilliant idea. And I was wondering where you were holding the news conference uh, to announce it. And are there any details so we can help spread the word? Oh, thank you so much. Yeah, the, the news conference is going to be held uh, on uh, Unchained TV um, on April 24th. And so please uh, join Unchained TV, download their app and stay tuned. It's going to be there on that. And we are going to have Viga the Cow <laughs> during the news conference. She's, being, she's coming over from the UK for this purpose. And, uh, and thank you. you know, we are creating all the marketing materials. And uh, if you want to be a, a founding co-convener of World Food Healers Day, just uh, send me a note. And I can add you to that. That's great. Thank you very much, uh, Doctor. And um, um, at the moment, I don't have another raised hand. We have a few minutes left. And uh, again, folks, if anybody wants to raise their hand, please do. Just click on your reactions tab. Click on the raised hand function, and we'll see your hand come in. Um, I'm I'm curious. You have uh, a new movie out, uh, Milked, relatively new, right. and uh, and and obviously a few more movies that are set to come out, I think, very soon, if I have that correct. I'm just wondering if you could share a little bit about some of those for our audience. Yeah, so Milt is out. Uh, it was It is on Water Bear and it's on YouTube, um, on the Plant-Based News channel. And we are going to have a screening of that during our convergence on April 30th and May 1st, and along with a Q&A with the producers. Um, so you can meet the producers, talk to them. Chris Huriwa will be there and Amy Taylor will be there. So it is, uh, it's doing very well. I mean, it, it's very well done. You know, I, I'm so proud of those people who put it together, Chris and Amy and Keegan. And uh, we have The Land of Ahimsa, which uh, will be released in August. We're planning at least to release it in August. And it is, uh, I've seen it and I think it's, a, it's dynamite. Yeah, one of the best you know that we have done so i'm really looking forward to the impact that will have in india it's mainly aimed at indian india and the dairy consumption in india got it wow wow will that show up on plant-based news as well or elsewhere or is it just going to be over in on the we are looking at various ways of distributing how to distribute that the same with the um they're trying to kill us um, it was, uh, the, we tried to do a grassroots distribution initially. It didn't work out as well as they thought. So now they're looking at uh, other options and how to distribute that. That's also a very powerful movie. Uh, any, anyone who sees that you know, um, is moved by it. Just like every other movie you've been a part of. Um, well, yeah. Thank you so much. No, thank you so much. We appreciate it. We do have a couple of more raised hands. So I'm going to go now to Ray. Welcome, Ray. Ray, are you hi, there? Doctor. Yeah. Hi, Dr. Rao. I, uh, I, I follow your message, and it's always so hopeful <laughs> for an environmental message that has, you know, a clear path that uh, doesn't require even a, a governmental cooperation as the mainstream of, uh, of uh, climate science, which, which clearly focuses on uh, fossil fuels and a change for a renewable energy grid. Yours, you know, empowers everybody to participate. And it's got such a uh, clear understanding of our, our purpose as, as human beings, not as the anthropocentric villains, but as potentially the anthropocentric, the, the, the heroes of the Anthropocene. And uh, could, would you t talk about that for a bit? Yeah, to me, it was a revelation, you know, that, um, that I'm so grateful to my granddaughter for showing that to me when she was born and um, she and, and she loves to play and she loves to play these infinite games again she never really wants to finish a game you know I, even when she was two or three years old you know she we would play uh, shoots and ladders and she would suddenly decide she wanted to go down a ladder and supposed to go up a ladder <laughs> so she would go up a shoot or so, down a shoot so see it everything becomes a play right everything becomes a play for her and so letting nature play and then we play with nature so looking at it as play 
as opposed to something very, very serious that we're doing in order to, you know, climb on top of each other's shoulders <laughs> and, and be the big cheese, you know, I mean, who's going to fall anyway? <laughs> so it's, it's one of those things, right? So you start looking at things from the perspective of nature, as nature being the, um, the one who's orchestrating all this. Then you realize we have been used. And, you know, not only do, did I realize that we have been used, I felt like, you know, please use me more. <laughs> you know, how can I be of service? How can I send this? How can I tell this story so that everyone hears it and understands that we are part of nature? We've always been a part of nature and that, and that the evidence is there now, right? That she has been doing something through us, which is to create homeostasis for all life on earth. So the temperature will stay constant no matter what the sun is doing, right? So, so it's like homeostasis for all, all life on earth, as opposed to going to an ice age and coming out of an ice age, going to an ice age. If you keep doing that, you know, it's a yo-yo thing that is not very good for life. So I saw that as, as this larger purpose that we have been born into. And, and then I saw the beauty of it and, and the tremendous intelligence that went into making this happen. Yeah. Because when I was looking at the, the temperature of the ice, uh, uh, the ice ages and coming out of the ice age and so on, it reminded me of what I was doing with the internet. <laughs> because when I was doing the internet, that's what happens. The, the two chips on either side are trying to lock to each other and go, the clock goes up and down like that. And eventually when it locks, you can see it's stabilized and then you can send data. Right until it locks, there is no data. That's what happened to my modem, and for 15 minutes I couldn't get it to lock <laughs> because there was something going on on the line, and finally it locked. And here we are, you know, so I could make this presentation. So it's, it it reminded me of that, you know. So so that's really what we have been doing with nature. We are playing a game, and nature has been playing a game with us. And eventually now she's saying, wake up, you're done with that phase. Now you have to become serious about this. Yeah. So. Wow. Um, thank you so, so much, Dr. Rao. And really, thank you. Um, what you've done and what you continue to do is nothing short of heroic. And I, 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 I would like to say thank you on behalf of all of us, but I'd like to do better than that. We're going to unmute our entire audience who I know would like to thank you as well for, for your time here today and last night as well. Um, so thank you very much. And tech team, please unmute our entire audience. What does everybody want to say to Dr. Rao? Thank you so wonderful. much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.